good. All right, so welcome to Kalmekak Netzawalpili. This is the Liminal Hour Series Seminar number three, titled Down the Rabbit Hole, the Fly Agaric Mushroom. It's brought to you by the Xochipilli Sacred Ethnobotany Club at San Bernardino Valley College, and I'm grateful for their support and their sponsorship. So today's topic is the fly agaric. Some people say fly agaric. I tend to say fly agaric um, mushroom, which has the scientific name of Amanita muscaria. And so I'll be talking about these mushrooms. I'll be calling them Amanitas. I'll be calling them fly agarics. Sometimes I might call them toadstools. Sometimes I might call them the Alice in Wonderland mushroom. Uh, lots of different names for this specific uh, fungus. We, today, we're going to be talking about classification. Uh, we're going to talk about the description, the biological description, the habitat. Uh, we'll talk about the active molecules or agents in um, the mushroom. And um, we'll talk about the effects of the psychoactive effects. And we'll talk about some representations in pop culture, as well as uh, look a little bit at ethnography. And we'll end with a trip report. Now. Uh, this is the Sacred Ethnobotany Club, and so um, we mainly talk about plants. And so at the very beginning here, let's just acknowledge that mushrooms are not plants, but I will sometimes call them plants, just so that I don't have to call them something else. All right? They're not animals, they're not plants. Um, uh, and so just bear with me, I recognize that these are members of the fungi kingdom, and as such, belong to uh, a, an entirely different group of living, um, of living organism on this planet, all right? So as you probably know here, fungi include yeasts and molds and mushrooms. They are heterotrophs, which means they dissolve, um, they dissolve organisms around them uh, in order to obtain food. Uh, in that regard, they're like humans. Uh, we do the same, right? That's what our di digestive system does, is dissolves um, uh, food for us to access that nutrition, uh, as opposed to the photosynthesis of plants. And so in this regard, fungi are separate and unique from plants. They also uh, inhale, for lack of a better word, oxygen and, and exhale carbon dioxide. And so um, actually, uh, fungi are more closely related to animals than they are to plants, which is a pretty remarkable thing. There are approximately 2.2 uh, to 3.8 million species of fungi uh, on the earth, uh, which is remarkable because we've only described scientifically about 148,000 of them. And so if you guys are interested in a career in mycology or biology, hey, lots of fungus out there for you to describe. And if you do describe, and it gets accepted, maybe you can name it. That's always fun, uh, giving a, a, an organism a name. Um, a lot of these fungi have uh, very kind of clear and important medicinal uses, um, uh, as well as uh, comestible uses. That's to say you can eat them, right? They're tasty, they're delicious. Morels or whatever, you get you know, mushrooms on your pizza, et cetera. And so they have a lot of uses to um, mankind, humankind, and uh, we'll be talking about some of them uh, today with a very kind of narrow focus on the Amanita muscaria. Uh, there are also numerous fungi that have psychoactive qualities. And um, we've been talking uh, before, um, Kalmekak, we've been talking about the psilocybin mushrooms. And so psilocybin mushrooms will have its own lecture seminar uh, next semester. And so we won't talk a, a lot about them today. Um, but an extremely important uh, fungus for its psychoactive uh, characteristics and qualities. Ergot is another, which is a type of fungus that grows mainly on rye crop and um, produces ergotism or St. Anthony's fire and was the basis for the discovery of LSD. And um, it's also most likely the source of the psychoactive ingredients or components of the morning glory seeds, small amounts of fungus growing inside the seed that has this um, kind of pseudo LSD effect. In fact, 
Uh, it contains LSA, which is lysergic acid amide, uh, which is um, the closest natural analog to LSD in nature. And so uh, it's very significant. And we'll talk about ergot, ergot poisoning, uh, St. Anthony's fire, and LSD in a future lecture. Uh, today, we're going to spend our time with the fly agaric. And um, so let's get into it a little bit here. Uh, the genus is Amanita, and in the Amanita genus, there are approximately 600 different species of mushrooms. And many of these mushrooms contain deadly amatoxins, and amatoxins uh, um, are extremely um, damaging to uh, the, the human uh, organism. Uh, the, the, mo the main uh, kind of poisonous Amanitas are the death cap, which we see here and the destroying angel, which we see here. And you'll see there are lots of similarities between the death cap, the destroying angel, and the Amanita muscaria. And that has led to um, a lot of confusion sometimes and misidentification and consumption of these mushrooms, either the death cap or the destroying angel can produce kidney and liver failure and death. Uh, one little mistake could be your last. And this is likely the reason uh, that entire cultures are very kind of suspicious and wary of mushrooms. Um, this is particularly the case in the Anglo tradition where mushrooms are often labeled as toadstools. And toadstool is a name with a very clear and negative and dangerous connotation. But of course, interestingly, other cultures have learned to distinguish safe and edible mushrooms from their dangerous cousins. And this difference led amateur mycologist R. Gordon Wasson to label um, uh, certain, care, uh, certain cultures as either mycophilic or mycophobic. And so myco here is the prefix for mushroom, right? Mycology, the study of mushrooms and fungus. And um, philic there is love. We see it in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love and phobic is fear. And so the idea here is that certain, um, yeah, go ahead. Ah, perfect. Perfect, uh, I'll, I'll finish this up and then we'll pause. And so certain cultures uh, have been labeled as either mycophilic, if they have an appreciation for and kind of a sophisticated ability to identify mushrooms and incorporate them into the culture, whether it's medicinal or culinary or whatever. And on the other hand, we have mycophobic, which would be societies or cultures that tend to resist the incorporation of these, um, of, of, uh, I'm gonna say plants, I know I'm wrong, but it's just easier to say than fungus. I get, I'm getting tired of saying fungus. Um, the incorporation of these plants into their, um, uh, into their, their cooking cuisine or medicine, et cetera. Um, all right, let's pause for a couple of minutes here and then we're going to handle some food issues and then we'll come back guys. Let me pause here. All right, so R. Gordon Wasson is a very interesting person and we need to introduce him right now because we're gonna talk about him quite a bit more when we get to psilocybin mushrooms, okay? He plays a very important role and the diffusion of psilocybin mushrooms into the Western civilization. Uh, his day job, see if this is up here. His day job was vice president of public relations for JP Morgan Bank in New York. How crazy is that, right? Wow. So a very powerful man, very well connected. Uh, and in his, uh, uh, in his off time, he was an amateur mycologist. Uh, this most likely stems from the relationship he had with his wife, Dr. Valentina Pavlovna, who was a pediatrician from Russia. And while on their honeymoon in the Catskill Mountains, he was intrigued by the different attitudes that he and his wife shared when they came across mushrooms. Unlike Wasson's own tradition, Russians love mushrooms. This interest started a 50 year career studying the powerful effects of psychoactive mushrooms. Uh, he made considerable contributions to the field of mycology, including writing the article that introduced the Western world to psilocybin magic mushrooms. 
One of his most important publications is Mushrooms, Russia, and History. Uh, this is a rare and beautifully published book. Um, thankfully, there is a copy of this book in the special collections at UC Irvine. And I was lucky enough to go there and be able to take a look at this book and make some uh, photos, uh, take some photographs of this book a couple of years ago as I was studying Teo Nanakat. Um, it's quite rare. I think this might be the only book available at a library in California. And so um, if you have the chance and you're interested in the topic, it's definitely worth uh, going to look to see that. I've got some pictures here. And in fact, that book uh, is an autographed version. Does that show up? I don't know. If not, I can put it right here. It's an autographed version, both Keith and his wife signed the book. Quite interesting. Check that out. New York, May 18th, 1957, the year it was published. We gladly autograph this copy of our book for, I don't know who Brad L. Kinbot is, but Valentina Pavlovna and R. Gordon Wasson. And so uh, the parts that I was interested in, not so much, I'm um, reading with Barry, I find and find a bunch of pictures of his discussion of the magic mushrooms of Mexico. And he did a thorough study and investigation of the magic mushrooms of Mexico. And um, it's a very, very well-written resource uh, for, the, for the mycologist. <clears throat> so Wasson and others, like Carl Ruck and Richard Evans Schultes, coined the term entheogen in 1979. The term is derived from two words of ancient Greek. The adjective entheos translates as full of the god or inspired or possessed and is the root of the English word enthusiasm. Uh, Genesthai means to come into being. Thus, an entheogen is a drug that causes one to become inspired or to experience feelings of inspiration, often in a religious or spiritual manner. These scholars argued that terms like hallucinogen or psychedelic were inappropriate owing to their relationship to words related to delirium, insanity, and psychosis, as well as various pop connotations from the 1960s. In modern usage, entheogen may be used synonymously with these terms, or it may be chosen to contrast with recreational use of the same drugs. The meanings of the term entheogen were formally defined as follows, as follows in the Journal of Psychedelic Drugs. In a strict sense, only those vision-producing drugs that can be shown to have figured in shamanic or religious rites would be designated entheogens. But in a looser sense, the term could also be applied to other drugs, both natural and artificial, that induce alterations of consciousness similar to those documented for ritual ingestion of traditional entheogens. In 2004, David E. Nichols, um, a very important uh, scientist in the psychedelic field, wrote the following. Many different names have been proposed over the years for this drug class. The famous German toxicologist, Louis Lewin, used the name Fantastica earlier in the century and as we shall see later, such a descriptor is not far-fetched. The most popular names, hallucinogen, psychotomimetic, and psychedelic have often been used interchangeably. Hallucinogen is now, however, the most common designation in the scientific literature, although it is an inaccurate descriptor of the actual effects of these drugs. In the lay press, the term psychedelic is still the most popular and has, and has held sway for nearly four decades. More recently, there has been a movement of non in non-scientific circles to recognize the ability of these substances to provoke mystical experiences and evoke feelings of spiritual significance. Thus, the term entheogen derived from the Greek word entheos, which means God within, was in introduced by Ruck and others and has, been, and has seen increasing use. This term suggests that these substances reveal or allow a connection to the divine within, although it seems unlikely that this name will ever be accepted in formal scientific circles, 
its use has dramatically increased in the popular media and on internet sites. Indeed, in much of the counterculture that uses these substances, entheogen has replaced psychedelic as the name of choice, and we may expect to see this trend continue. One of Wasson's hypotheses is that the Amanita muscaria mushroom is the primary psychoactive ingredient of the famed ancient Ved uh, Vedic potion Soma. Have you guys heard of Soma before? Not the modern medicine, but the ancient potion? Um, and so in the Brave New World, as well as modern day Soma, which is, uh, which is a pain reliever, I think it's a prescription pain relief reliever. Um, both of these uh, different drugs take their inspiration from this ancient potion that is, uh, that is currently unknown. We don't know what was in it. And so it was a potion, uh, it was a drink that was consumed uh, in ancient times. We're talking several thousand years ago, mainly in India by um, mainly Aryan. So the Indo-Aryans, uh, it looks like they had, uh, had the, um, the knowledge of this potion and they would write in their Vedics they would write in their uh, in their poems. They would write entire poems about this potion called soma that would relieve pain and would make you float away and would make you kind of feel a closeness to God. And um, and so um, R. Gordon Wasson was of the opinion that the main ingredient of soma of the Indo Aryans was uh, Amanita muscaria. Uh, this idea is something that we will more fully. Uh, discuss when we get to ergot and LSD and St. Anthony's fire, uh, because that is the other proposed ingredient of soma. Um, and people have proposed lots of different ingredients, including psilocybin mushrooms and other things. Uh, and so we'll discuss that a little bit more in the future. Uh, let's talk about a description, biological description of our uh, topic here. I'm Anita Muscari. As you probably know, mushrooms are the sexual organs or fruiting bodies of larger underground mycelial networks that make up the bulk of the fungi kingdom. And these are some of the largest living organisms on earth. Sometimes they can cover up to uh, tens or hundreds of acres of land, all living underground and unseen by, um, by humans. And obviously they reproduce through the dispersal of spores and the mushroom is the mechanism for the mycelial network to disperse its spores. Uh, Amanita muscaria mushroom is a large, common, and numerous where it grows uh, mushroom. The cap is covered with white pyramid-shaped warts, which are left over from the universal membrane or veil that covered the entire fruit while still small. Here we can see the different points of that veil. And we can see that as the mushroom goes, grows larger, those points become farther and farther apart. The mushroom starts out small and round, and then when mature, it flattens out like a plate. Fully grown, the caps can be from three to eight inches in diameter or even larger. The gills are white, um, as is the spore print, which we see right here. I don't know if you guys are familiar with spore prints. Uh, spore prints uh, is the way to both um, reproduce the mushroom as well as sometimes to identify the species of mushroom. And so you take, uh, you pick a fresh uh, mushroom, uh, particularly right after the lower veil breaks. Here you can see. To start, um, to start being shot out of the gills. That's the main uh, organ that disperses the spores. And so you take a mushroom uh, uh, that has recently broken its veil, you remove the stalk, and you place that mushroom on often a piece of aluminum foil or something like that, and those spores will start to release. And you use the spores uh, to identify. You can um, look by color. And so color is an identifying characteristic. Uh, and you can also put those under a microscope and look at the shape uh, and size of the spores to help you identify the mushroom. Uh, that also allows you to reproduce the mushroom 
because you can take those spores and you can inoculate certain uh, material and you can create mycelial um, networks and you can uh, and, and you can create the conditions for the mycelial network to produce mushrooms. And that's essentially the way to reproduce the mushroom. Uh, it has a white stipe or stalk. <clears throat> Um, the stalk or stem or stipe is usually about two to eight inches long and about a half inch to an inch wide. The base is a bulb, and there are remnants of the partial veil, which covers the gills uh, of immature specimens. And lucky for you, whenever possible, I will bring in examples of the plants that we're talking about. And so today I'm bringing in um, a box full of Amanita muscaria. I don't know if you guys can see that. And I'll pass them around here. Maybe I should. Here we have a pretty good um, sample. Online, can you see can you see that uh, the doc camera there? I don't can't yes, tell. But Kadir, I'm, I'm can you see the mushroom <laughs> that I'm showing you here, the real sample that I've got up here? Maybe, maybe uh, not. No, I... And so hear um, here we can see the gills. So here we see all the gills. That's where the spores are released. Here we have the site. You can kind of see the veil over here on the side that originally covered all the gills. And then we have the end here. And I'll pass these around. Um, these were collected in Colorado. Them. My nephew identified them, and so um, I, I suppose there's a chance that they're not Amanita muscaria. Uh, but he was he was pretty confident that they were, and so um, they're completely harmless to handle. If you do want to handle, uh, that's fine. Um, and you can see kind of this the iconic kind of uh, red color is kind of faded, probably to kind of a, more of an orange color here. Although the center is quite a bit darker, you can see. The iconic spots of the area that were part of the area that was covering the entire outside part of the fruit here. And I think um, just for comparison, Shay, why don't you pull out the largest one there? This is probably a medium sized specimen that I have in the box. And then for comparison here for the largest one I have, which is probably more like four inches across. You can't really see because it's kind of folds it up here, but it's quite a bit, it's quite a bit larger. All right, so that's physical description. Let's talk a little bit about habitat. Again, as I said, um, those specimens that I have there were found in Colorado, um, but habitat will depend on a number of things. And like most organisms, Amanita muscaria has certain preferences, okay? So it's considered a cosmopolitan species, which means its range covers most or all of the world. It's native to conifer and deciduous woodlands throughout the Northern hemisphere, so mainly in the North. Um, but recent studies propose that its ancestral origin uh, might be the Siberian Beringian region. Okay, here we see a picture of, um, of the mushrooms located in a, a coniferous uh, environment. So uh, coniferous meaning having cones, pine cones, pine trees, and deciduous meaning trees that lose their leaves. And so uh, mainly located in these kind of forest areas uh, throughout the Northern hemisphere. It is considered mycorrhizal. And mycorrhizal means that the mushroom has a symbiotic relationship with trees, mainly pine, oak, spruce, fir, birch, and cedar. And the way that the, these different uh, species interact is that the root systems of the trees provide the mushroom with glucose for food, and the mushroom provides nutrients for the trees. And so this connection between um, red Amanita muscaria mushroom and pine trees or 
or, or, or deciduous trees or um, um, conifers, uh, et cetera, um, might be quite important in, um, in our modern representations of uh, Christmas. And so it's quite appropriate for us to be talking about the Amanita muscaria uh, in this month when we uh, are thinking about uh, Christmas trees and we're decorating our Christmas trees. There definitely seem to be some connections between the, um, the, the, the cultural use of this, uh, of this substance and the way that we represent Christmas and the way that we celebrate Christmas. Um, and we might get into that a little bit more uh, in a little bit, but for now, I'll leave it at that. Um, these mushrooms can also appear in so-called fairy rings or pixie rings. And these are, as you can tell in the picture here, these are uh, very interesting um, uh, arrangements of mushrooms in nature. They form these circles. And I, to tell you the truth, I'm not exactly sure how or why they form these circles, but this pattern is quite common in, with, with mushrooms. And you can find Amanita muscaria growing in these fairy rings or pixie rings. And obviously, as the name kind of um, shows, uh, these are very important in Western European folklore and mythology, being either good or bad omens, uh, usually tied to magic and, and magic circles and, and different types of rituals performed in, in uh, wooded areas. Um, any comments or questions so far, guys? Please, Athena. Uh, so good. Um, uh, who would you get permission from? The fairies? Okay. So there. So this it, it must be tied to Wicca or some kind of Western European uh, nature religion. Good. So Athena raises the um, the the principle of when working with magic, um, uh, you can see this across cultures as well. When working with magic, uh, sometimes people call it medicine, right? When working with medicine or when bringing medicine onto um, a, a native land or something like that, you need to uh, uh, address the authorities and basically get permission, whatever that might mean. Uh, in order to practice your medicine, to practice your magic, et cetera. And so um, using magic or medicine or science or whatever you wanna call it appropriately within the correct uh, power hierarchy is, is a very important principle. Uh, so that's uh, very well uh, received. Thank you very much for that. Um, let's talk a little bit about the biologically active agents and, and effects. Another comment or question? So for, for the benefit of those online here, um, the question was, how, who do you address 
to ask for permission to enter a fairy uh, ring or to exercise some kind of magical power? And the answer was Dagda. Uh, Dagda, you said the king of the fairies. Is that any particular belief system, tradition, et cetera? It's Celtic, okay. So, um, so Celtic traditions here, good. And um, and then the analogy was made to you would you would uh, invoke Dagda the same way that a Christian would invoke God, address by the name, state what you want, and I imagine there's some kind of close as well. Don't say thank you. Okay. <laughs> So maybe no clothes. I, I stand corrected. <laughs> Brianna has a comment or question. Yeah, and, and you know, when you look around, uh, there are lots of different traditions that have some kind of belief in Little people, fairies, gnomes, creatures, protecting, protective spirits, um, fairies, I mean, whatever you want to call them, right? Uh, leprechauns, I mean, you can see them quite a bit in lots of different traditions. Athena. Brownies? Is that? I've... All right. Uh, sounds like uh, Cinderella. And right, and and her helpers. Oh, is it Joshua? You have a comment. So the question is about how do you receive the answer. And so it sounds quite a bit like something that a Christian would say, the still small voice of the Holy Ghost, right? If it's comforting and reassuring in your soul, it's positive. If you have a stupor of thought or you don't feel good about something, then, then the answer would be negative. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and so what I find so interesting is um, you can take such such different traditions as Christianity and some of these Celtic traditions. And you can see the principles, underlying principles that are quite similar, invoking an authority, asking for whatever, um, and then getting a response through some kind of spiritual uh, means, right? And I find that absolutely fascinating. Uh, any other comments or concerns, guys, questions? You called it the Fae. The Fae is the kingdom of, of let's, we call it, I imagine most of these things are like protector spirits that protect streams and rivers and lakes and, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so, so um, Joshua is asking about the different classes of fae. fae. I guess that, that's the fae of fairy, um, of fae. And so it sounds like you have all kinds of different levels, categories. They probably have different responsibilities and authorities.
And so for the uninitiated or, or maybe someone with a Christian background, I would remind you that there are different categories and levels of angels as well. You have archangels, you have seraphim, you have cherubim, you have all kinds of different degrees of angels with different responsibilities. And so again, this idea that, you know, this idea that if you're Christian, it, it, what your beliefs have nothing to do with the Celtic beliefs or that, that type of thing is not necessarily true because the idea here is that there are be powerful beings that that are somehow connected to the earth that have certain responsibilities here on earth that sometimes interact with people. And so um, again, the commonalities here, I think are most amazing. And, and I love um, exploring all the different manifestations in the different cultures. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, any other comments before we move on? All right, so let's look at the biologically active agents and effects. So the most important biologically active agents are ibutenic acid and muscimol. Ibutenic acid is a precursor of muscimol, which means as it's ingested into the body, it gets converted into muscimol. Um, but ibutenic acid itself is, um, it's, it's a little unclear what its uh, psycho psychoactive effects are, um, other than being a pre-drug of muscimol. Uh, after being broken down in the liver. Um, but onset takes about 30 to 60 minutes for ibutenic acid and includes a range of effects on the nervous system, usually all negative. Uh, that might include nausea, vomiting, drowsiness, confusion, but possibly euphoria and maybe other visual and auditory distortions. In children, ibutenic acid can cause, can cause lethargy and sometimes convulsions. And so the effects of ibutenic acid are not very positive. And usually when people talk about the psychoactive agents in uh, Amanita muscaria, what they're referring to is the muscimol. And muscimol is, uh, is a potent and selective GABA agonist, which means it works in your brain and attaches to certain sites in your brain that causes certain effects that are, that are somewhat sim similar to benzodiazepines or barbiturates. Um, muscimol was first isolated by Western science in 1964. So we haven't known uh, much about this for very long, at least not compared to other substances. When consumed, muscimol alters neuronal activity in the cerebral cortex, hippocampus, and cerebellum. The psychoactive dose is around 10 to 15 milligrams for a normal, per normal person. And because the concentration of muscimol can vary, from species to species or from, uh, from specimen to specimen, dosage can be quite difficult to determine. And this makes working with the plant difficult and dangerous, um, possibly kind of like Datura. We've mentioned that before. It's difficult to know how strong a plant is. Uh, uh, and so using Datura uh, can, can, be, can be tricky. It can be, um, can be potentially dangerous um, and can be potentially negative. And so uh, the most common effects of muscimol are euphoria, dreamlike state of mind, out of body experiences, and synesthesia. And synesthesia is where you, you have a kind of a crossing of sensory input. So you might see um, music, you might, uh, you might you know, hear colors or, uh, or, or something like that. So you have a kind of a, a crossing of your sensory input. Uh, it's quite common in, with other substances like uh, psilocybin mushrooms. Negative effects of muscimol can, in, uh, can include nausea, increased salivation, muscle twitching and tremors. And in large doses, dissociation or delirium may be experienced. All right, so Amanita muscaria is, uh, in my opinion, and I think everyone would agree, the most recognized mushroom in the world. Uh, it is famously represented in the story of Alice in Wonderland, uh, first printed in 1865. In the story, the mushroom has the power to make Alice, Alice change size. And so eating from one side of the mushroom would make her grow. Eating from the other side of the mushroom would make her shrink. 
And it's very interesting that people that report using uh, Amanita muscaria talk about this idea that your perspective uh, seems to be changed and seeing things far away or up close or seeing small things really big, or really big things small. And so uh, this is a, a quite common experience with other substances. Sometimes it happens with cannabis. Sometimes it happens with um, psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, but it's very interesting that in writing the book, Alice in Wonderland, they used this mushroom in order to change perspective and shape and size. Um, we see something very similar with the 1983 Nintendo game, Mario Brothers. And there are a variety of powerful mushrooms in this game with the most classic red and white version, making Mario converted to Super Mario, makes him again grow in size, all right? And I think under certain, cir 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 certain circumstances, doesn't he also get the power to, th to throw fireballs? Maybe that's a plant, I don't know. Uh, but here we have a lot of different mushrooms in the Mario games and this the flower. Is the flower. So the, the, um, the mushroom, the red and white, the classic Amanita muscaria, red and white mushroom makes him grow, right? Increases in size. And so again, very interesting that two different um, fictional uh, creations use this mushroom in order to alter the, the abilities and powers of, of humans. And I would assert that it is no coincidence. Famously, the Smurfs, created in Belgium in 1958, lived in and around Amanita mushrooms. Uh, additionally, the dancing mushroom scene of Disney's Fantasia also depicts mushrooms based on the fly agaric or Amanita muscaria. <clears throat> All right, let's talk a little bit about ethnography here. In the early 18th century, explorers and academics began traveling to Northeast Asia and recording their experience as they encountered the shamanic-based religions of the area. Philip von Strahlenberg was the first to encounter the fungus in Siberia, uh, and his descriptions of its use were published in English in 1736. So this is the first Western accounts of medicinal, magical, religious use of the fungus in Siberia. Amanita muscaria was widely used as an entheogen as part of shamanic ritual throughout Siberia. In the Western parts, its use was restricted to shamans, important religious leaders of the tribe that played a key role as an intermediary between the land of the living and the land of the dead. In Eastern Siberia, on the other hand, both religious and lay people use the mushroom religiously and recreationally. And so we see quite a bit of, of variety in use and who could use it and when and how and why they could use this mushroom. The Koryak people of Eastern Siberia include the mushroom in their mythology. The creation God spat on the earth and his spittle became what they called wapak or the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Um, Raven, a very powerful um, deity-like animal, ate the mushroom and became so powerful that, that he was able to carry an entire whale to his home. He then told the mushroom to always grow on the earth so that his posterity could learn from it. Um, on the other side of, um, of the continent, the notion that Amanita muscaria was used by the Viking warriors known as berserkers was first suggested by a Swedish professor in 1784, based on the use of the mushroom by Siberian shamans. Uh, this idea became widespread in the 18th century, but there is very little evidence to support such a claim. Uh, based on descriptions of the berserkers, a more likely candidate for their intoxication is black henbane. Um, usually Amanita muscaria puts you into kind of like a twilight, a euphoric twilight um, state of mind where things feel like dreams and you kind of go in and out of this twilight dreamlike state. And then once you're unconscious and sleeping, you kind of have very vivid and active and interesting um, dynamic dreams. And that doesn't seem to match up uh, perfectly well with the accounts of ber berserkers, which are usually um, 
uh, warriors that, ha that are kind of out of their mind with such little fear that they run into battle naked to face the enemy with no concern for their own well-being. And again, that, that doesn't sound as much like an Amanita experience as it might uh, be like a, a henbane experience where you're kind of dissociated and kind of amped up and hallucinating and you can't really tell what's real and what's not. And you're kind of, uh, kind of like, um, just kind of a, just in a different state of mind, I think. All right, uh, let's um, end with a, a trip report here. This is taken from the online publication, which is quite good that I was recently exposed to called Double Blind Mag. Uh, it says the following, the Amanita experience holds meaning and spiritual significance in some cultural traditions, as well as for some individual explorers. Yet the mushroom is distinct from classic psychedelics. Many of those who ingest the fly agaric report having colorful visions and religious or spiritual insights. But Amanita's visions and insights commonly, though not exclusively, occur in dreams once the user has fallen asleep. Sleep is a common occurrence after Amanita muscaria. Such lethargy is rarely associated with classical psychedelics. Moreover, the Amanita muscaria experience lacks what scholar and author Kevin Feeney calls the electric quality of psychedelics. That's to say, the geometric overlays and light that shows uh, that that uh, and light shows common with tryptamines and ergolines, the active compounds in psilocybin mushrooms and LSD, respectively. They're not common to the Amanita um, experience. Dissociation is a hallmark of the fly agaric experience. In his essay on the subju uh, subjective effects of Amanita for the fly agaric compendium. Feeney adduces a particularly evocative Arrowhead account of a user who thought I was a deer and ran through a forest, dropping out of awareness. Upon recovering under a tree with little memory of what had taken place, the user had missing shoes, ripped clothes, and a giant scratch as if from an animal. Retracing the steps the following day revealed the travel distance of the traveled, uh, the traveled distance to be six miles, spanning five barbed wire fences. R. Gordon Wasson gave the following account in his book, Soma. The results were disappointing. We felt nauseated and some of us threw up. We felt disposed to sleep and fell into a deep slumber from which shouts could not rouse us, lying like logs, not snoring, dead to the outside world. When in this state, I once had vivid dreams, but nothing like what happened when I took the psilocybin mushroom, uh, mushrooms in Mexico, taken from Soma by R. Gordon Wasson. All right, um, that's it. I don't have anything else for you guys. So unless you have comments or questions or anything you'd like to share, um, uh, that's it for me. Comments or questions, Athena? Mm. Ah. So the comment is this idea of not being roused by the outside world, lying like a log, Athena comments, that's the effect of, of, of cannabis uh, when you smoke it, both when you smoke it and you eat it. Gotcha. So mainly when you smoke, you're out. Gotcha. knocks you out. Uh, any dream states? All right, good. Uh, so the question is, um, will taking um, a mushroom, having a mushroom experience, I'm needing a or a psilocybin mushroom, result in having a changed cannabis experience after? Yeah. And from what I've read, yes. From what I've read, it's kind of like, um, uh, think back to Albus Huxley's book on his peyote experience, right? The Doors of Perception. 
this idea that the psychedelic experience, the classic psychedelic experience, whether it's um, native, uh, whether it's psilocybin mushrooms, peyote, or LSD, um, kind of opening that door of experience often results in a cannabis experience, you know, in subsequent days, you know, days or weeks or months or years later. Uh, in a cannabis experience that is more similar to the psychedelic experience than it was before. Um, it looks like Shane has a comment. I have, in my own anecdotal experience, I have used psychedelic because I've used psychedelic experience. Yeah. 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 Y
when it's not working for you or when there are certain negative effects. And when that happens, then it, you need to exclude it from your routine, right? Because it's not having the positive effect that you, that you want it to have or that you had in the past. And so I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, Brianna has a comment or a question. It's a really good question. You know, why do we see the flag, Eric, everywhere? I mean, everywhere. I've got over on our table here, I've got, you know, four different examples, five different examples of it just from being out. Every time I see one of these things, I'll buy it, you know? And so, um, you know, I've got little toys and little candy containers and little decorations and some artwork that a Valley College student prepared and you see it everywhere. And I don't have a good answer for you, but, um, and I personally have never seen one in the wild, but when my nephew was uh, shared these with me, he gave these to me, he said, seeing them in the wild is magical. It's, you mentioned the beauty, right? It's such a beautiful species. It's, it's, it's remarkably beautiful. The deep red color and the white spots and they're gregarious and sometimes there'll be a, you know, a cluster of them or a group of them. And so I don't know if it's because of the beauty. I don't know if it's because Western, med, Western science, <laughs> excuse me, and medicine was exposed to these earlier than magic mushrooms. You know, Western science has only known about magic mushrooms for 70 years. And we've known about uh, the Amanita muscaria for, you know, I don't know, 100 and 250 years. And so maybe it just had more time to get in to the culture. Maybe, um, maybe it filled some niche that we had, some requirement for a magical, natural experience. And through Alice in Wonderland and through the Smurfs and through all these other things, it kind of filled that niche. And because the niche was filled, we didn't really need to fill it with anything else. I don't really know. It's a good question. Uh, that's worth uh, uh, exploration. exploration. Uh, comment or question, Athena? Yeah, and the, so her comments are that it, it's so distinct in its look. It's so it's so appealing in its uh, in its aesthetics, and I would agree with that. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful organism, um, and I would love to see some of these in the wild because um, I imagine it's like I said, a magical experience. You know, it's like seeing uh, like. It's probably no coincidence that the Smurfs come from Belgium. Uh, you know, Europe, Western Europe has a long tradition of, of being familiar with these um, organisms and including them in their artwork. They show up, you know, in 19th century um, Christmas cards. And, uh, and so it, it's very, um, it's a magical experience. It'd probably be like Gargamel searching for the Smurfs, looking for the Smurf village and seeing a village and being, oh my gosh, that's so crazy. That's, that's magical, right? I imagine seeing a cluster of these would be a magical experience. Um, I think there was another hand or a comment or a question. So the link to Christmas is something I guess we didn't explore a whole lot in the presentation, um, and, but there, do, there does seem to be some kind of connection between the Amanita muscaria and the, uh, the decorative aspect of Christmas. And so you've got um, Christmas trees, evergreens and pine, pine and fir and different kinds of trees being very important in the celebration of Christmas, especially in Western Europe. And so bringing the pine tree into the house and decorating the pine tree, putting presents underneath the, the, the tree, right? Very interesting aspects of uh, Christmas. And what, what we see in kind of a lot of these indigenous um, practices in Siberia and Northern Europe is, again, the connection between the Amanita muscaria and the pine tree is that they're in a symbiotic relationship. They both need each other. And you tend to find Amanita muscaria is growing around and under pine trees. And so shamans, when they would um, 
We would go out and look for the fruiting bodies, usually in late uh, late uh, autumn. Would go out and find these and pick these um, mushrooms. Often, uh, I've heard that they would they would dry them out by placing them in the tree itself. And so um, the connection between the Amanita muscaria and the pine tree, the possibly putting them in a tree as some kind of decoration. Um, uh, and then also going around and collecting all of the dried uh, mushrooms. And then often what they would do is they would go around and um, give them to different members of the tribe. And so the shaman is kind of responsible for finding them, drawing them, uh, handing them out, if you will. And then there's also a very interesting connection between the Amanita muscaria and reindeer. And so reindeer um, like to eat the mushroom. And um, they will go, they will search out the mushroom. They will purposefully intoxicate themselves. They, uh, it's not just for food, it's, it's to get intoxicated. And, and this is not unique in the animal world. Uh, in the animal kingdom, there are no, uh, numerous animals that will interact with intoxicating plants, whether it's elephants eating, you know, uh, fermented fruit or whatever. Um, but lots of different animals will intoxicate themselves. And, and so a reindeer uh, will intoxicate themselves on the magic mushroom. And um, it's just such a curious way to celebrate, celebrate Christmas with uh, a bunch of flying reindeer, right? It's so weird. It's always seemed weird to me. And so this connection between Amanita muscaria and also kind of like the feelings of flying through the air. I mean, it's one of the possible effects of, of, of muscimol intoxication is this feeling that you're flying soaring through the air. And so there might have been um, a connections. These are all kind of tenuous, kind of unsubstantiated and kind of unexplored connections, at least that I've seen. I haven't seen any concrete evidence but there just seem to be lots of coincidences. Too many coincidences for my liking, you know? Too many coincidence, coincidences to not mean something. And you've got to remember all of these Siberian tribes that have these shamanic religions and a history and a cultural use of Amida muscaria are all reindeer herders. That's what they do is they herd reindeer. And so they have a closer connection to reindeer than any other people on planet. And it just so happens that they have a, a, a whole tradition of magical religious use of this fungus. And so um, that's interesting. And then we didn't even really get into some of the more interesting and shocking aspects of the shamanic use of um, Amanita muscaria in Siberia, which would be, you've got the two components, uh, um, just looking at the chat here and before I get to what I was gonna say, uh, Kadir says dolphins like to intoxicate themselves with the puffer fish and neurotoxins too. That's awesome. They'll play with those puffer fish, make them expel their toxins. And then you can see they're having a good time. Interesting that purposefully seeking fun toxins spans the animal kingdom. Definitely Kadir, thank you for that. And so um, the, the, we've got the two main psychoactive ingredients of Amanita muscaria, which is the ibutenic acid and the muscimol. And ibutenic acid we've seen has lots of negative effects and is to be avoided, right? And there are different ways to avoid it. One is carboxylation, which is taking it, uh, drawing it out to the point where the ibutenic acid converts into muscimol. That's the more desired molecule that has more of the classic hallucinogenic, entheogenic, or psychedelic effects to it. Although I think probably it's not technically a traditional psychedelic but that's beside the point. And so the, the other way to get all of that ibutenic acid converted into muscimol is to filter it. And you run it through one of the greatest filters on the planet, the human body. And so the shaman will eat the mushrooms raw or possibly cooked or maybe in a, in a tea. I'm not exactly sure, often it's, it's raw. They will experience the muscimol. They will have a trip their liver will convert the ibutenic acid into more muscimol and that will be evacuated through the urine. And so the urine of a, of, um, of a muscimol intoxicated shaman contains a whole bunch of muscimol and guess what? Almost no ibutenic acid. And so it's all been converted. It's all been converted into muscimol. And so um, they're going back to I don't know, the 1700s, there were stories of 
um, of these shamans uh, consuming the mushroom, excreting through their urine a good portion of muscimol, and then either re-drinking it or giving it to members of the tribe to drink in order to have the positive effects of the muscimol without the, the nauseating effects of the ibutenic acid. And in fact, not only would tribe members consume the urine of the shaman, but if a person intoxicated on muscimol urinates in the snow, say, right? The reindeer will smell it and they'll come and they'll eat it. And they'll eat the urine looking to get the muscimol. And so um, it, you've got a, it's, you know, a very, very interesting, very interesting constellation of factors that I don't know if they can ever be answered, right? You know, some people even say, oh, the red and white of the Amanita is Santa's, you know, clothing, the red and white suit. Eh, who knows? Maybe it was Coke. Maybe who knows where the red suit came from? You know, because if you look at 250 year old pictures of Saint Nick, he's not wearing red fur. He's usually wearing, he's usually like a green outfit or something like that. And so I don't know, you know, but there's a lot of interesting symbolism, a lot of interesting kind of mythology and a lot of, we have a lot of kind of interesting beliefs that don't seem to be explained by other means. And a, a kind of a magical religious explanation might be a good explanation. It's tough to say. Any other comments or questions, guys? Well, possibly, right? He's the one that drives the sleigh with his reindeer. He's he's the reindeer herder, right? Well, possibly. I don't know. Yeah, and and we're really getting to the point where we're speculating a lot. Um, but I've I've read numerous places, and it might be folk etymology, right? It's always it's always a possibility. But I've read numerous places that oh, the red and white suit mimics the red and white coloration of the Amanita Muscari. I'm less convinced by that, but I'm, I'm very interested in flying reindeer. That is, that is, that is crazy. I mean, flying reindeer? Yeah, who wouldn't want a flying reindeer? And how do you get those reindeers to fly, you know? And yeah, and so there, there might be something to that. Um, you know, a lot of kind of what we consider to be Christian traditions and Christian ways to celebrate are really just left over from the pagans, you know? And so, and so, I mean, Christmas itself is, you know, a, a celebration in the middle of winter is not a celebration of Christ's birth. He was born in the spring. That's when the, the shepherds were out in the fields with their flocks. You don't take your flocks out into the fields in the winter. Yeah. Uh, they think it's sometime in the spring. I, don't, I haven't. I haven't read Saturnalia. Uh, Saturnalia is one of those uh, pagan gods. Saturn. Is this the holiday? Yeah. So, so I have not heard of Saturn. Well, I, I don't know much about Saturnalia. Is there something you would like to say about it? Okay, <laughs> for a different day, maybe. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, we're left with kind of a lot of open-ended questions. Um, uh, but I think I've, we've explored um, the, the species as well as we can, um, looking at, you know, biology, looking at chemistry, looking at uh, eth eth ethnography and, and different things. And I don't know if we'll be able to answer any of those other questions. We're left to wonder, unfortunately. Uh, but I think it's very appropriate for this time of year. Any other comments or questions? All right, uh, that's it. Thank you guys so much for being here. We're going to call it a, um, a day, and we will see you guys next semester. Thank you so much.